Kia ora. Hello. Namaste, everyone. Thank you for coming here. Thanks to New Zealand Python user group for this opportunity to share my and my company's uh, Python journey with you guys. I'm Amar from Data Genius Software Labs. We are a Christchurch-based company. Uh, I'm happy to share how we applied uh, Python in solving a routine maintenance forecasting problem. Um, we are a company which also uses Microsoft technologies, Java technologies, open source. And after working with a couple of different technologies, going from Ruby on Rails to Microsoft C Sharp to Python, in the last 12 months, we have discovered that Python is really a great choice. Um, earlier, a presenter was talking about whether Python suits the large data sets. Is it fast enough? Is it robust enough? Is it scalable? And what's the deployability? Because these are the questions which anybody uh, running an enterprise-grade application will be dealing with. I come from a banking and finance industry, having worked with JP Morgan Chase, where typical data loads on any given day, you're looking at hundreds of millions of trades from all over the world. And the data volume on any given day, uh, running into typically 400, 500 gigabytes at the very, very least. And when you process this data on an hourly basis, and you're driven by the need to have a near real-time experience in analyzing, processing, and providing the right inputs in terms of analytics. I was using Python a couple of uh, years ago uh, at J.B. Morgan Chase, so I thought, let's leverage that. And when this client, I will start my uh, uh, project description in a few minutes, but when the client approached us, they had a very brief prototype in Ruby on Rails. And they were discussing whether to go into Microsoft Azure Cloud with C Sharp or whether to go into a Java Oracle kind of environment which is deployed on AWS. Um, the choices were too many. And we took a brief journey to really uh, experiment with the same level of data set, same level of complexity, do uh, a baselining in terms of performance across these different environments. And we found that Python runs pretty well. It's a scalable, easily portable across different environments. While we were doing that, Microsoft also came with a nice support for Python in terms of the core library. So that really gave us a shot in the arm, and it really allowed the whole project to boost from there. Like other industrial requirements, aircraft engines also require maintenance from time to time. But a big difference, obviously, as we all know, is in case of aviation sector, even a small mistake could be fatal. So the chances cannot be taken. In case of other industrial landscapes, you can possibly postpone, prolong, or maybe delay um, the maintenance requirements. But in case of aviation industry, it is of paramount importance that it is uh, prioritized and it is executed almost immediately. Uh, more so because the, uh, the regulatory landscape is very, very tight. Um, therefore, the industry uses a very, very careful approach in its serviceability towards uh, planes, engines. And when I talk about serviceability, it is not necessarily just repairing an engine not just replacing some of the parts, but even a routine inspection is considered as a service and has to be completely logged, it has to be audited, and it has to be regulatory compliant. To be on the safe side, industry does take a very long margin of error in terms of uh, the serviceability of these uh, aircraft engines. So, even if uh, a craft engine is coming due in the next two weeks, three weeks, uh, they would like to bring it in for inspection, repair, overhaul, whatever is the case. Uh, also, uh, they take uh, a very, very strict and conservative estimate in terms of when the engine should be scheduled. For example, if the manufacturer 
instruction says that this engine should be serviced every 1,500 hours of flying or every 15,000 hours of flying, they actually reduce it uh, by 15 to 20 percent. In some cases, even 25 percent, they reduce the duration because they want to be on the, uh, on the uh, you know, right side uh, to have a nice margin of error to avoid any possibilities of something going wrong. So there was, as we could see, uh, certainly if we could prove, not only mathematically but also operationally, that some of these margins could be reduced without compromising the operational safety of the crafts, that would result in not only the time and operational uh, productivity and profitability of these corporations, but also the financial aspects. And aviation industry does run on very, very lean margins, as we all know, so any little improvement does go a long way. The engine maintenance certainly is dependent not only on the flying time of each of the engines, but also the time a craft is spending in taxiing, waiting on the tarmac to take off. Um, there is also auxiliary engines at the rear of the, uh, the craft, uh, which are also an important uh, attribution and uh, input in terms of overall craft maintenance. Uh, also, uh, how long the craft has been or rather the engine has been uh, serviced. Uh, even if the plane has been parked on tarmac for some other repair, uh, there could be a degradation in the engine, even sitting idle, uh, not even being started. So they, these all uh, different kind of, uh, uh, I would say, conflicting requirements do go into uh, consideration of what would be the right time to, to service an engine. And uh, as I said earlier, most of these maintenance requests cannot be uh, simply uh, be postponed. Uh, most of them have to be done as and when they are due. Uh, but a, a very important problem uh, is that the workshops, which, which is hangar, is not available. Uh, they have limited space. Uh, also, the specialist engineers who are going to work on uh, some of the routine maintenance may not be available. They have to be flown in or something. And most importantly, if the parts are being replaced, then parts have to be available. So you can see these are all, very, you can say it is very, very obvious that somebody was going to solve it. Uh, and our client was struggling with it. We were the fortunate one to, to get into that space. The question was what technology uh, to use uh, to try and solve this problem. And uh, that's basically the main topic for my conversation today. So as I said earlier, uh, FAA, uh, Federal Aviation Administration in US, uh, it issues uh, what is called as airworthiness directives from time to time for different uh, models of the same engines. And whenever an AD comes in, it, in short, it is called as an AD, uh, the manufacturers take a look at it immediately and they issue what is called as a service bulletin. And a service bulletin could be, hey, mandatory, down all crafts, right away, go into an overhaul maintenance or whatever schedule. Or it could be informational, hey, by the way, be aware in your next overhaul, take care of these two additional checklists or these two additional uh, you know, um, uh, correction steps. So it could be informational, it could be instructional, or it could be like you have to execute it right away. So different ADs, uh, ADs is AD, is coming from FAA and it is mandatory. It has to be done as soon as AD comes out, all the engines which are affected by it have to be serviced. And it is obvious uh, if the planes do not have uh, a backup engine, uh, typically you're talking about a twin engine craft. Uh, in case of A380, you, you have even six engines. Uh, and uh, the companies which are maintenance uh, specialists um, they have only a limited availability of engines on hand to keep as a backup. Uh, you cannot have unlimited, uh, of course, all these engines are pretty expensive, uh, silly to say, but that's basically um, the, the, the how the industry works. Um, most important thing is that not only when a craft comes in for an engine servicing, it comes in with both engines. So one could be serviced now and one could be serviced three months. The, the plane will come back again. Uh, you don't really take the, the engines out of the craft and just swap it like that. Uh, bless you. Uh, so in this particular case, what happens is when these planes are uh, scheduled 
and if they are brought in out of the schedule for uh, maintenance services, it impacts the revenues because of the bookings that are uh, going to be impacted. Uh, and again, if the engines are not available in abundance for backup, certainly the crafts are not available for, for backup. Uh, so that's a big problem. As you can see, these are two conflicting problems to solve. One is optimizing when is the right time to bring an engine for servicing, and another one is to maintain the level of schedules so that the financials are not impacted. Another problem is if a plane is flying, let's say, international flight from here to Singapore or from here to, uh, to Houston, uh, the, the challenge is that it might be in an area which is not in the serviceability of the maintenance operator. Uh, the airlines usually do not have their own maintenance operations. They outsource this to specialist companies which work very collaboratively with these uh, big airline operators. Uh, and if a craft is on a foreign land or even in a different segment where the, where the maintenance uh, company does not have a presence, then servicing that craft in out of network is a super expensive uh, proposition. So the idea will be to preempt the maintenance need of an engine and do it while you are in your own segment and you can service it in a cost-effective manner. Another problem with the sales uh, people is, so I was referring to all along big planes, big airlines like Singapore, American, United, Air New Zealand. But there is also smaller companies. Uh, Lockheed Martin uh, operates a uh, lot of private jets. There's a lot of private jets uh, given by Learjet and other companies and other manufacturers in US which are in operation. They are usually twin engine crafts as well. And they are also to be maintenance and they are driven by the same set of regulations. Uh, and therefore, uh, in this particular case, it's a very lucrative market for the maintenance companies. Uh, their sales teams are trying to reach out to the companies who own the craft and sell them on serviceability of the plane. Say, hey, if you're gonna bring your craft in for engine repair, we can also replace your seats, we can also do this. So it's a sales proposition for them as well. If the sales team is working randomly based on the guesstimation, uh, then they are able to squeeze that much dollar out of the client relationship. But if this relationship can be directed in terms of a well-defined schedule, uh, which is tied very well with the maintenance, client is also happy because it doesn't impact their financial, uh, financial, um, uh, uh, financial uh, I would say, forecast. But also at the same time, sales, for sales it is easy to convince the client. So these are a couple of uh, things which were driving this particular project. In one simple sentence, we were trying to reduce the aircraft downtime with all the conflicting requirements being given. So in first phase of solution, what we uh, tried to do was that we tried to bring in data from public repositories, uh, for example, uh, the FAA feeds for AD and uh, manufacturer service bulletins, and that's an automatic read from FAA site. So it is instantaneously available. You can map uh, the crafts which are in operation in your network and find out which service bulletins apply, which uh, airworthiness directives apply. Uh, you, can, you can map that to the public tail information, so you can draw the, the complete timeline of an aircraft engine in its flying time, in its taxi time, in its idle time, in its shutdown time. Uh, so we, we did that. Uh, we had a huge uh, data set to deal with. Then uh, you also combine the engine's uh, information itself coming from different sensors which feed uh, the ground operations. And what we did was that we resulted uh, with, with tons of data. So we applied uh, a basic Kalman filter to, to A, deparse the data and to optimize on the usage and C, most importantly, to predict uh, the outcomes where we had missing information on the engine. So this information comes from public databases. The problem is that the, uh, the regulatory uh, framework does not have every hour basis input 
on an engine flying operation. It comes in sort of milestones. So, you know, it will come in five days, it will come in three days, it will, in some cases even it will come in two weeks. Uh, whenever you hit the milestone data, you know that the plane has flown, let's say, 1,500 hours in last seven days. But is it 200 on an average, on a daily basis? Or it, was it 300 and 300 and remaining in three days? So that's a difficulty when you're dealing with this kind of data. So Kalman filter allowed us, if we did a basic extrapolation it, or, or, or basic interpolation, it would be the same simple uh, average calculus. But Kalman filter allowed us to do a good uh, smoothing out of this data and to draw a better forecasting in terms of the engine's real flying time. So that gave us a very valuable input in terms of, um, you know, the 1,500 hours is possibly on Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday, given the craft's other operational and ground information. That was very, very useful for us. Uh, then based on this, we did uh, three predictions around the, the engine maintenance. And then we were able to finally answer the single uh, simple sentence, uh, simple uh, problem, which is what is the right time that we should uh, call the engine in for maintenance. Anytime we generate new data, anytime we generate new uh, operational parameters of the engine, we write it back to the knowledge base so it gets accumulated over a period of time. We have been running this project for about a year now. And in last six months, we have been running advanced beta on this project. And the model is getting better and better. And I think that's basically the case with any machine learning problem that you're trying to solve. So in this particular phase, we have limited the approach only to the fixed wing, fixed wing crafts. We are not dealing with uh, the helicopters uh, or, or any other kind of uh, crafts or single, wing, a single engine uh, uh, planes which are rotary. Uh, we are also excluding auxiliary uh, power unit, which is also a type of engine for this particular phase of the problem. Uh, we are in this particular phase only limiting to FAA, uh, airworthiness directives and service bulletins, but also European uh, Aviation uh, Security Administration also issues similar airworthiness directives and service bulletins, which could be different and in parallel to FAA. We are not considering that right now. Uh, we are also, in this particular phase, we are not considering the workshop availability, uh, the parts and specialist availability to keep the model simple. But these are uh, problems to solve in future. Uh, the structure, uh, the architecture was pretty simple, that we combined the feeds from different sources like JetNet, ACAS, uh, different API web services that were exposed to us. Uh, from public uh, databases with regards to the engines uh, and also client CRM. Uh, we also tuned to FAA, ADs and SBs. We are 100% live with FAA, so anytime an advisory goes in, the system reads it right away and processes it. And the system is running all the time, uh, so uh, the, uh, the calculations are done almost on a real-time basis. Of course, there is a performance lag in terms of the computational uh, time required by the algorithm. It spits out uh, the analyzed inputs uh, for action in every four or five hours time window, which we're trying to reduce. So in case of uh, this particular solution, what we do is we map the public database, which is available at the tail number level. It is not available at the engine level. So we map the tail to the engines which have been installed. Uh, we find the engines which are under maintenance by our client, reduce the data set, apply the Kalman filter, uh, find out what are the maintenance uh, needs for those particular engines, and then there is uh, a database which is called as a prior events. Prior events is basically when was this plane serviced, uh, was anything done to this which could have impacted the maintenance. All these things are called as prior events. Uh, so together, these two pieces of information, uh, they allow us to do a forecasting uh, in terms of when an engine is due for its next maintenance visit. We combine those forecastings with the aircraft schedules, and then we give another analyzed uh, dashboard to the sales team so they can reach out to the client based on the recommended 
uh, maintenance schedules. For the technical architecture, we chose, again, a pretty uh, simple approach. Uh, we use the MapReduce approach to transform the huge amounts of big data that we had into a reduced structured fact base. Uh, we use Hadoop and Python for that. Uh, we use Py, uh, Kalman filter PyCalman, uh, which is looking at the engine usage, sensory and maintenance data, and giving us uh, the missing pieces of engine flying time uh, at the most optimal uh, uh, time in the milestone of the, of the craft. Uh, then we are also using Keras for the actual prediction. So what is the flying time prediction for an engine that is being produced? What is the useful time remaining for limited life parts? Aircrafts use a lot of LLP, that is the tech talk from the industry, but limited uh, life parts means that they are installed, they go as part of the whole engine, but they have their own life. And whenever uh, those parts have to be replaced, the engine has to be brought in so they can be replaced. And you have to keep a very, very detailed audit log and schedule and maintenance history so you can factor which LLP is to replace at what time. And again, some optimization was done there as well because if we could see that within a week there you have another LLP to be uh, replaced, then why not you replace both at the same time? And when the engine is going to come in for its maintenance, you can basically have those parts ready. So some work was done along that. So prediction does help uh, the client in this particular case. Uh, we used a combination of different clouds. Uh, we used Amazon and Azure Cloud, uh, because the client is using Azure Cloud, but we use Amazon for the elastic compute capability. Uh, and that basically provides us the, uh, the technology uh, backbone. To give you an idea, uh, the size of data that we were dealing with almost on a daily basis, uh, this is very, very minimal. Uh, the client has around 2,500 uh, crafts under their active maintenance. And the size of data that we are receiving on a daily basis is like the aircraft tails data is about uh, a half terabyte. Uh, FAA bytes, uh, they result in a couple of terabytes on a daily basis, sometimes less, sometimes more. Um, JetNet, which, is, which, which basically gives you the, the engine flying and plane flying times. Uh, that also runs into a couple of uh, terabytes. And definitely the engines which are under maintenance, which is just 2,500, every day it runs uh, uh, 50 to 60 million uh, records uh, of, uh, of uh, sensor information, maintenance information, flying information. So as I said earlier, um, the, this, this product has been in development about a year. Uh, the client has 2,500 crafts, and the client has seen an average of 23 to 35% uh, improvement in terms of their basic scheduling. Uh, if you look at uh, financial impact of almost a few million dollars on a monthly basis uh, with a wrong scheduling of a craft, uh, because it has to be either grounded or, or the schedules have to be canceled, uh, 25 to 30 uh, percent improvement it's, is a significant improvement for our client. They are pretty happy about it, and we are continuing with phase two of this product. Uh, there is definitely a lot of efficiency. One thing I would like to outline is that by doing this work, optimizing, and having a basic prediction of when a craft should be brought in has not impacted the operational safety of any of these crafts. It's only reduced the margins that the, the client was having as a fixed, defined margin to reduce any errors. But we have further optimized it. And that it basically has resulted in a significant savings already. Uh, in the next phase, we will be working on parts, inventory, uh, and workshop uh, prediction so, so that we can combine the three together and maybe uh, improve a little more. Uh, in terms of uh, the, uh, the aircraft grounding time and uh, its availability for operations. We're a small company based out of Christchurch, started operations fairly recently in 2013. Uh, we developed 
software and product. Um, we have done a lot of work in business intelligence, big data, and artificial intelligence. We have been mostly working in export markets. Uh, I myself uh, come from, came from U.S. six years ago to this nation, proud to be part of uh, the, the country. Uh, it's, a, it's a great nation. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great uh, country to be in. Uh, but in the last six years of working uh, my business here, uh, we have grown that into mostly an export-oriented firm. Um, we do have development center in Australia, India, New Zealand, and U.S. If you have any suggestions, questions, feel free to reach out to me. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Hi. Um, that was really interesting. Thank you very much for your talk. I was wondering if you'd had a look at the importance of the predictors and whether there was any particular predictors that were better at forecasting the maintenance window than others. Difficult to answer because we found, first of all, there were operational efficiencies in many different areas of engine maintenance. So we did had four basic predictors that we were able to generate from the basic data that was given to us. Clients' concern was pretty much limited to reducing grounding of their crafts, avoiding an impact to their scheduling, and therefore improving their financial profitability. That, that was basically client's focus. But being a mathematician and being a solution engineer, we were able to find four different areas where we could make better predictions. And that predictions basically rolled into the next set of prediction, which fed into the last one, which is the financial question that, that the client was trying to answer. Uh, my personal uh, favorite out of the four that we predicted uh, was really around what is the right time for the engine to be brought in because in some cases we are now recommending a client to bring their engines into repair even a month ahead of its routine maintenance because we are able to realize that a month later this craft might be in a heavy booking period and it will be grounded at that time causing a massive backlog. So it is better to bring it like now which will have a cost but that cost will be less than what you will incur if the craft was grounded. Uh, so we ended up basically having four predictions in the system. One was uh, the engine flying times, which, which was a difficult problem to solve because you have a non-linear data set and it cannot be extrapolated, interpolated, but using a Kalman filter, we have come up to pretty, pretty close to the, the uh, back testing that we have done to the training set that we had. So we could see that the improvement was made very significantly, which allowed us to uh, to make a good prediction around when a craft will have to be rolled in. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, maybe one other question then, because random forests are good when you've got a non-linear predictor, and I was wondering if you'd considered using random forests. We consider different algorithms, and we found that Kalman was able to give us the solution that we started with. Uh, you could say that it is more of a convenience rather than a mathematical determination to say that this algorithm is better or this algorithm. So, because we had to quickly develop a prototype, I'm not defending the choice. It was a simple, stupid choice, I can say that, right? But Kalman has worked out better. Uh, as we continue to develop this product, we will be evaluating other, uh, and, and thank you for pointing that out. So we will be evaluating at other algorithms and then possibly do a baselining because now we have data. We know Kalman gives us this, so now we are trying to derive algorithm A versus B versus C. Thank you. 
Oh, I'd like to. So first, I have a, a comment, and but it's not offensive. And uh, then I have a, a question for you. So my first uh, professional programming job was working at, for the U.S. Navy in logistics support and something very similar to what you did back in the 90s. So I appreciate the, the complexity that you're actually understating. I still have dreams of something called mill strip, which isn't in the civilian world. But um, so yeah, pretty, pretty awesome to, to see what you're doing. Um, and so since I kind of officially have to ask a question, um, so you mentioned that you're using both AWS and Azure Cloud. And I understand with, it sounds like with uh, AWS, that's where you're doing your data processing, it's where you're running the filters. And then Azure, it's everything else. Is, is there any reason for that separation? No, it was a heterogeneous environment given by the client. They run on a Dynamics 365, so they wanted to bring all the data back into 365. And we used Amazon to run our Python clusters, our Python grids, and also our uh, Oracle-based data processing, as well as Hadoop. So we were all running all of that processing in Amazon. That was our choice. But rest of the portion was given to us by the client, so we, like, we were like, okay, we'll flow it in. This sounds really familiar to what I experienced in the 90s, so thank you. Hello. So uh, it seems to me that you're a small software company with a small set of very demanding customers. And um, I think one of the common problems that you encounter then is that, uh, of course, every customer has very specific requirements and is very particular about how things integrate in their business process. So when you have that, do you have, uh, can, can you shed a bit of light on how you deal with these different demands of the customers where, for example, the way you process uh, predictions and such depend highly on the business rules and processes of the customers. How do you model, what strategy have you chosen to model those special conditions and business processes of the customers which then have to flow into your predictions? Uh, right, in this particular case we had a bit of leverage. Um, client gave us their technology environment. Uh, the data which comes for the plane tails and engines and FAA, it's all external, you have no control on it. We had a control on determining the implementation environment. It allowed us to not only service the client but also to create a product out of that servicing. Uh, and we chose Amazon, we are an Amazon certified partner, so we chose Amazon for that specific purpose. Uh, we use Amazon RDS uh, for high-speed computing. And I think you mentioned about Python, you know, you, I think you experimented with Python and saying that it works fine for, for big data earlier, if I remember correctly. But nevertheless, coming to your question, um, what we did was that in a segregated environment where we had a full control, we processed all this data. This data was not having anything which is private or which is uh, sensitive. This is all public domain information that we are sourcing. All we were mapping with the client was some engine IDs, and we do not know these engine IDs on which specific plane it goes, so there is no way that it is sensitive for anyone. So we were able to keep it contained in an external container, and we chose Amazon. We have worked long enough with us. Of course, um, uh, Azure is a good choice as well. But we had an environment which was Amazon, which was readily available. We had Python libraries, which were like plug and play. So we were like, let's reduce the development journey, quickly uh, do some mathematics and see where we go. It took about 12 months to get to this point. But, uh, but the, uh, the end points of this equation were defined by the client. They are using Dynamics 365, and they wanted us to write all this data back into uh, 365 after it has been analyzed. Uh, so that we did not really want it to impact, but we were happy that the client allowed us to choose our own implementation environment. So it's, it turned out to be a good choice uh, in, in the end. Is there a business model for large numbers of small private owners? Because your customers are like large fleet owners, aren't they? But 
like, you know, there's t millions of people, even in New Zealand, everyone's got their own car, their car gets old, should they maintain it, not, maybe machine learning can predict whether they should or not? Absolutely, absolutely, great question. So this, uh, some of the components that we have done in terms of uh, basic predictability of an engine, uh, that is independent of the underlying data set. So if you can separate the data set, the same product will work for a car engine, a truck engine, or even a farming uh, machine engine. Uh, and with different, uh, different uh, controlling attributes, of course. But it, is, it has been created in a manner where the calculation environment is separate from the underlying data. So yes, it can be used. And we are a small company. We are fortunate to having being worked with, uh, with this big, uh, big company. Uh, but we want to service the New Zealand market. I live here, this is my nation, so absolutely. Hello. Um, I was just curious to know why the auxiliary power units were excluded uh, I'm assuming that if then that, that they too can ground an aircraft, uh, or perhaps not, perhaps it can fly without an APU. Can it? No, okay. it, it can. It yeah. can. So you're absolutely right. The plane can be grounded if auxiliary power unit has a problem. Uh, but this was a prototype project when it started. Uh, it became a product of its own. But when we started the journey, the simple mandate was, hey, can you convert this Ruby on Rails? Uh, a uh, few lines code into a C sharp and tell us what it does. Then it converted into a Python because I was not comfortable with C sharp's uh, capability to deliver the power that we wanted. Uh, and also there were a lot of, uh, Python has a great choice because it had many frameworks available out of the box. You just plug and play, bring your data and you're happy, happy customer all along. So to answer your question again, yes, APE, the auxiliary uh, power unit, uh, they are uh, an important part of an aircraft, but we wanted to minimize the, the project scope in the beginning. And now that we have a generalized application available, I think we can include APE uh, to, to run an, uh, you know, a maintenance on, uh, on APE as well. And APE is more integral to a plane rather than the engines which are mounted under the wings. The, these engines could be separated, APE cannot be. So it's a brilliant point. Feel free to reach out to me. I would love to take up your questions and I can learn in the process. I think he has a question. No? Okay. <laughs> okay, thank you.